So hello everybody, uh, my name is Fiona Murray, I'm one of the associate deans uh, here in uh, the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, so I want to just welcome you all to today's I Lead conversation. This sounds very echoey to me. I imagine it's just the way it is. So we will cope with the technology because we are at an institute of technology. Uh, so this is the first time that I've actually had the opportunity to host uh, our leadership visitor. And I can think of no better person, in fact, uh, to be sharing this honor with than with uh, Dr. Sophie Vanderbroek. Uh, so I think I've basically known Sophie for over a decade, first having a chance to listen to her speak at various MIT conferences and other conferences, uh, and then to really have the benefit of her wisdom, especially around leadership in very, very technical, uh, deep technical engineering-driven organizations. And I drew a lot of sort of both comfort and insight from that because, of course, in many of our roles here at MIT, we're also leading in quite technical uh, organizations with um, very large... Uh, clusters and clumps of engineers, and that is really quite an art form and something to understand in and of itself. So like me, I think uh, Sophie has a very particular passion for issues of diversity and inclusion, both, I think, probably in the most obvious categories that we would think about that, but also inclusion across disciplinary boundaries, national boundaries, cultural boundaries. And so I think she'll touch on some of those issues. Um, Today, she's actually the inaugural visiting scholar at MIT's School of Engineering. Uh, but like anybody who understands complex organizations, she's tremendously good at and recognizes the power of crossing boundaries. And so we're really appreciative that you come all this way across campus. Uh, in fact, I think you came back from New York to be with us uh, through the polar vortex. So thank you for doing that, Sophie. Um, Sophie recently stepped down as VP of Emerging Technology Partnerships at IBM. Before that, she was COO of IBM's uh, research research, during which time she was really instrumental in creating this amazing relationship that we have uh, between MIT and the IBM Watson AI Lab, uh, which is a very exciting uh, new activity for MIT. Uh, prior to that, she was a CTO of Xerox, which included leading their global research laboratories, uh, and that responsibility included uh, Park, so the Palo Alto Research Center, which is such a storied part of kind of innovation and R&D history. So we're looking forward to a few insights uh, into that as well, I hope, Sophie. And finally, I think it'll, it's important for me just to mention, Sophie grew up in Belgium. Uh, she's got a master's in electromechanical engineering from KU Leuven, and then her PhD is in electrical engineering uh, from Cornell. And so once again, having spent that much time high above Cayuga's waters in the real cold, you're perfectly uh, well accustomed to living here in Boston, as I know you now do. So uh, with that, Sophie, can I invite you to join me up here? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, what an honor to be your first... Uh, victim. Yeah, your first victim here. I mean, the hot chair this morning. Exactly. Yeah. So, and occasionally we get sort of cushy chairs, but I think, you know, this is an engineering sort of talk, so we're going to stay awake and, and, and uh, you know, be, be sitting here. Um, so I actually wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about your career trajectory, because I think it's really interesting the way you've gone to lots of different organizations. You haven't just been in one. I think you might have a slide you're going to share I with us. I do. I am a very visible, visible person, so I like to visualize uh, concepts of what I talk about. So I create a slide. Um, let me share it with you. So this is a, a road, and so I started, as Fiona said, I uh, got my uh, master's degree in electrical and mechanical engineering at KU Leuven. Uh, during, as a senior, I had the great privilege uh, to go work and do a summer job in HP Labs in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And it was there that I became totally convinced that I wanted to come to the United States for uh, my PhD and be in uh, one of the best uh, centers and the best colleges in the world to study microelectronics. One of the two key messages that you will see in my roadmap is that number one, I was always striving to be part of a community of brilliant people that I could learn from, right? I mean, striving for excellence. And number two, just to say it bluntly, you should never burn any bridges because I cross the bridge multiple times back and forth, as you will see. Um, after uh, my master's degree, I worked at IMEC, the Inter-University Microelectronics Center in Belgium. It was just founded by Professor van Overstraten in 1985. Uh, I worked there for a year while my husband was finishing up uh, his uh, undergraduate degrees. 
And then we were both admitted in Cornell University, which is, uh, had a really great microelectronic center. He went to do his MBA. Um, and uh, when you see little icons like that, it just means at the same time, our, uh, one of the kids was born, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so when I was at Cornell doing my PhD, Elena, my oldest, was born. And uh, she actually went to Cornell for her undergrad and graduate degrees and is also an, en an engineer at the moment working in the Netherlands. So after Cornell, uh, I went to work at IBM in uh, Yorkton Heights, because again, IBM was the best research lab in the world for microelectronics, which I had my PhD in. Uh, and yes, my second son was born, who is a biologist and, uh, and biomedical sciences at the moment, working in Tokyo, university in uh, Keio University. Um, but I was living seven hours from home. Home was Rochester, New York. We didn't have a green card. Um, so it became very complicated, and I moved to Xerox, and I knew Xerox from Xerox Park. So again, one of the, the best research labs in the world, uh, and there my third son was born, who just graduated with a mathematics degree and works in an MIT startup. At least he stayed close to home, which was great. Mm -hmm. So I worked at Xerox for a while. Uh, I became first vice president in my late 30s, and I went to lead the Canadian Research Center Material Science Research Lab in Canada, which was really fantastic. Um, then Xerox was on the verge of bank bankruptcy, you might remember, maybe in the year 2000. We were losing $350 million a year. The headhunters started calling, and uh, I was invited uh, to become chief technology officer, senior vice president at Carrier Corporation. I was still in my late 30s. Uh, the guy, the CEO, new CEO at Carrier, had an amazing vision of uh, moving to a platform-based approach. If you have any questions about innovation and innovation processes, products, solutions, please ask them. I'm not sure we're going to cover a lot mm -hmm. of that, but I would be happy and the like to talk about it. So I was at Carrier. Um, and you see that's a bent in the road there. Um, and so I stayed at Carrier for about a year and a half until my boss, the CEO, went on to go lead a small company in Portland, Maine, called IDEX, which was an animal diagnostic firm. And he left. Uh, the new CEO that came in uh, was a CFO type background, financial background. And really, I wasn't aligned as much uh, on a philosophy of R&D investments, et cetera. So I called my old boss in Xerox, Ursula Burns and Anne Mulcahy, uh, and I asked. I used to live in Rochester, New York. I was commuting back and forward to Syracuse and Hartford. And, uh, and uh, my boss just left. Uh, Can I come back? And they said, yes, we would love to have you back. So that's how I went back to Xerox as chief engineer and uh, went, stayed with Xerox for the next 15 years, 11 years of, uh, I was chief technology officer running all the labs globally and the whole innovation portfolio, including Park, as you mentioned. I moved to Boston. Um, and then three years ago, and in the meantime, once you become a corporate officer in a large corporation, uh, you also have the opportunity to join public company boards. So I joined two public company boards, uh, both in the Boston area. I traveled so much for work that for my corporate board work, I wanted to be close. So Analogic was in Peabody, Massachusetts, and IDEX is in Portland, Maine. Yeah, there is IDEX. So the person I worked for at Carrier went to lead IDEX. It's now a $25 billion market cap company, very, very successful, the largest uh, animal diagnostic company in the world today. And so my old boss uh, recommended that I join the board, which I did, which was fantastic. So another bridge that I went over. Um, and then three years ago, when Xerox split into two, we had an activist investor, Carl Icahn, but also the board decided it was better to split and keep the base printing publishing business, which was an $8 billion revenue business, separate from the business process outsourcing business, which we were in healthcare, transportation, et cetera. And so we split the company. Most of the management team left, including myself. I had uh, really, I always worked hard on grooming the next generation. So we had two great CTOs ready that went to each of the two new companies. Uh, and I was going to come to MIT yes, at the time. We talked right. about that. I, I got an offer from you, you did. remember? Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, I was going to be an innovation fellow for a year. Yes. Uh, but IBM? kept calling when they heard that I'd left Xerox. And they, for about six, it took about four to six months. And, and finally, at the end of the year, right before I left Xerox, I, uh, I decided to go to IBM. 
uh, called Fiona and said, oops, I'm not coming, <laughs> but I'm here now. <laughs> but so. you're only a few minutes down the road. So. Uh, that's right. <laughs> and so I, uh, and I went to IBM because again, IBM really has at this moment the best commercial research lab in the world. Everything from nanotechnology to AI and artificial intelligence and everything in between, blockchain, quantum computing, 5,000 people in 21 locations around the globe. They had a gap in their senior leadership, uh, which I filled as chief operating officer, and I helped get uh, Dario Gill, who is totally brilliant, also an MIT grad, ready. He became director of research uh, earlier this year, and that meant my job was finished. And so I uh, took what I call my corporate sabbatical for the academic year. I joined uh, the School of Engineering at the school level as the inaugural scholar. Of course, there have been many scholars in the, in the school at different departments. Working with Ananta, the Dean of Engineering, on helping to build, leverage my learning over all these years in corporate to build a more inclusive uh, and diverse grad school, which is near and dear to both of our hearts. Uh, and at the same time, I recently also joined uh, as a trustee uh, on the board of the Museum of Science here in Boston. If you haven't been there, uh, it's the biggest museum in Boston, 1.5 million visitors a year. They have a great exhibition now about body works, if you want to learn about the human body. And, uh, and they have so much potential. So I joined as a trustee, and we are fundraising for a whole new wing. Uh, I want something like the Sydney Opera House over the river, but they tell me your dream is a bit too big. We're not going to get that much money. But if any of you know of uh, big <laughs> investors that uh, really want to invest in one of the biggest science museums in the world right here in the core at the bridge between uh, Cambridge and Boston, let me know. It's a fantastic So that's it. Many bands in the road, huh? So maybe you can tell us a little bit. I mean, you know, this is obviously the um, I Lead series. Can you just tell us a little bit how you think about leadership? Yes. So I, again, I like to visualize it. I have a few slides so we can talk through it. Um, it all starts, I mean, whether you're in a corporation or a university, or a startup, or a nonprofit, it all starts with people. I mean, people are the foundation and the base uh, which will really help build a great organization. Mm -hmm. And so, and in fact, since you were, uh, so the, uh, and often it's forgotten. People talk about the customers, the shareholders. I am convinced uh, it's about people creating an environment where you can truly at attract the best and brightest to come work for you, mm -hmm. and where you can, especially if you do something really difficult, right? Whether it is uh, within a large corporation, which what I'm mostly used to, uh, launching new products and services that will disrupt the traditional business. Like in Xerox, we were constantly looking at how do we disrupt the printing business, right? What other uh, innovations can we launch that is really gonna cannibalize in the end our own business, but either we do it or somebody else will do it to us. So you need to build an organization where people can, I say, truly bring themselves to work uh, and, and be their own self, uh, whether uh, you're a woman or man, uh, no matter your ethnic background or your accent you can never get rid of, even after whatever, 35 <laughs> years in the US, uh, no matter your gender identity or sexual orientation, your veteran status or your age or physical abilities, you name it, if you can create an organization where people want to be, you're mm -hmm. going to be able to attract a really great talent. And in addition, the clients of most businesses today uh, are also very diverse and global. So having people on your team that can truly bring that mindset is extremely critical. I think, again, under people, uh, another thing that is very important uh, is that uh, you have your ticket punched because you need to gain credibility to influence, right? Mm -hmm. My job leading a CTO or leading major research labs was not only making sure we had exceptional science being done, but make sure that science translates into business value. So you constantly had to be able to influence. And so for that, you really needed, and we can talk more about that, what I call gain the credibility and respect from all of your peers. And then finally, the importance of relationships, building the relationship, this is still another people thing, is extremely important. Uh, being an engineer, mm -hmm. I thought if I invent something that's just better than what was there previously, uh, and I have many examples, 
the whole corporation will be behind it, I will get funding, it will grow, and, but that's really not the case. I learned that late in my career because I was so focused on the data and the numbers. And so truly understanding what is it that makes others in the organization afraid. Um, like we were gonna, we had invented in the lab in Canada when I was there, chemical toners, which you grow the particle from nano, uh, particles all the way to the toners, which are like five microns. I know your chemistry in your background. Um, and so those were chemical processes, and Xerox was used to grinding and molding dry particles into small particles where you actually have to wear an apron to go into the plant because you get dirty from all the dust or whatever, the, the grinding and molding. And the other one is growing chemical processes. You have to wear an apron to make sure you don't contaminate the process. So totally different. And I had so much, even though it was better quality, better cost, better for the environment, I had so much reluctance and I just couldn't understand it. But it came down that most people had built their career on building conventional toner plants. We had the biggest capital investment in that. So there were many, many other reasons than only technical reasons on why this wasn't gonna go. Uh, as easy as I had imagined. But once I understa understood that with a lot of input and help from mentors and we were able to actually switch and, and introduce this new mm -hmm. uh, technology. But really the relationships is extremely important to all other people. Yeah. And then so, there is of yeah. course the clients and partnerships and mm -hmm. some other elements that are very important. So you said you want the best and the brightest to come to work. Mm -hmm. Especially in these technical areas that you've led, these enormous engineering teams, you know, as we know, the best and the brightest, especially uh, in certain disciplines and areas, can often attract people who are quite difficult human beings, not least because when people are the best and the brightest, regardless of whether that's the arts or any other field, can be sort of prima donnas all at the same time. And so how do you deal with that, with the complexity of the personalities? And you're totally right. So running, uh, it's not as bad as in MIT. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing. But, what, can um, we, what can we say? <laughs> Sorry, guilty uh, as charged. But if you, <laughs> if you uh, run a research lab, like the Palo Alto Research Lab or Yorktown Heights, you have brilliant people with the specialists in their field. At uh, IBM, we had 10 Nobel Prize winners, so really exceptional people. Uh, and so as a, Manager, I use specifically the word manager because you are a leader in your subject even if you don't manage people, right? So even just the words you're using and always understanding, being curious, being respectful. Um, and the most important is that you can, in, in this industrial setting, uh, what we did, both in IBM and in Xerox, uh, is if you do research for Xerox products and services, of course you need some guardrails to make sure the research is aligned with what the business will need. Mm -hmm. But in addition, very similar to university, we said if you can raise funding, uh, either from the government or other corporations or through IP, IP licensing or equity in startups, uh, you can invest in other disruptive technologies that mm -hmm. are ultimately important, most probably, for the Xerox or the IBM business. So at Xerox Park, for example, we incorporated Park uh, maybe 15 years ago. About half the revenue at Park comes from doing projects for Xerox. The other half comes from these four mm -hmm. entities that I mentioned. And at IBM Research, which is this 5,000 person organization around the globe, about 35% of the funding comes from doing research for the government or other clients. And so you can, in, a, in Xerox it was very valuable because the part team had invested in artificial intelligence and in many technologies, uh, leveraging government funding and other client funding that them and Xerox did a big acquisition um, uh, of a business process services company, we could immediately then apply those competencies and capabilities we had built towards doing research for Xerox. So it's all about not never, I mean, not having these hierarchical structures, but really empowering and, and then having some guardrails and then as a, as a manager, eliminating barriers uh, for the team members. So I'm curious, when we talk about leadership, people will often talk about the things that they do and it, you often, people as accomplished as you make it sound very easy. Um, so I'm curious, as you started to get into some of those leadership roles along the journey that you shared with us, 
you know, what were the things about leadership that you found the most challenging? So if you had to think about the few things or the few moments or pivotal moments that you found particularly challenging or difficult. Yeah, and I can, I, I can uh, give a lot of examples. Uh, let me just show here. Back. Um, so there are a lot of specific examples. I can gonna give you an example at Xerox, and then I can give you the carrier example. However, overlaying all of this at the meta level is having enough time. I mean, and I, I, I can also see that at MIT, most professors, most students, you're doing so many things, right? So time was always my biggest challenge, especially raising the kids at the same time, right? So. Uh, at the time level, at the very high level, and again, if there are more questions, I can talk more about it. To me, it came down to three things, prioritizing, mm -hmm. right? What is important to me at which part of my life? Uh, then leaning in, as Cheryl Sandberg said, on those things, mm -hmm. like striving for excellence in your role, in your job, or as a student, or making sure you, you, you raise a happy family. Uh, and, and then the third thing that I learned in prioritization was, was very much having taken care of yourself. I have to remind, uh, I, I, I have open office hours here at MIT now, and so entrepreneurs show up, many students, they do their PhD, uh, or maybe an MBA at Sloan, or a PhD in engineering, and then they do a company that's totally nothing to do with their PhD. I'm like, make sure to take care of yourself, right? Because it's so busy uh, that you sleep enough, that you eat healthy, that you exercise, and that you have at least one best friend. It's very important. But anyway, so priorities, leaning in, uh, and then leaning out everything else, that's the most important, the leaning out, right? So saying, no, I'm not gonna do that right now, I'm not gonna volunteer, or I'm not going to, whatever, uh, organize many social events, or I'm just gonna say no to these things at this point in my life. And so that's something that I, I all along had to manage. Specific leadership challenge, let me give you an example at Xerox when uh, I was, again, I was after my PhD, late 20s, early 30s, and I became, I was asked, I was already a project leader, so I had maybe five people in my team, but I was asked to start to, to step up and lead an organization of 50 people, all the research for thermal inkjet, microelectronics, systems related to inkjet printing. Um, and the vice president the night before tells me, we have a communication meeting in the morning, we want to announce this. I'm like, okay, tell me today, tomorrow announce. Uh, and by the way, we think you can do it. And by the way, don't worry. Uh, because I'm, I'm reorganizing, I, the VP uh, of, of Rochester, New York, I'm reorganizing such that your management box will have two people in it. It's you and another guy, I'm not gonna call his name, I still uh, rec remember him very well, but he had been with Xerox for like 30 years, very respected, he and I were gonna manage his lab. And I was already like, how is it gonna work? I'm like, have his age. I'm not gonna get any credibility or respect really from the team members. The whole lab was older than I was uh, almost. It, it wasn't a very young population. Uh, so I said, let me sleep over it. I went home, I talked to my husband at night who luckily had an MBA and went to the business school and <laughs> basically told me, Sophie, say no, you can't do that. I mean, nobody's gonna come to you. You're just gonna, whatever, have the title, but uh, so you have to go back and tell them you want to do it because I wanted to do it, but you want to be alone in the box. So, okay, <laughs> I go back the next morning, I go to the VP, I said, I slept over it, I want to do it, but I want to be alone in the box. And he's like, the PowerPoint slides have already been made, the meeting is in a half hour. <laughs> I said, really, no, I can't, I can't do it with two people. I mean, I mean, you know, right, that I didn't, I was so young that maybe I might have been naive and think that I would have had any power at all. And so anyway, they took his name out of the box. Uh, I think he became a fellow at Xerox Research or something. And, and I went on to lead that lab, uh, which was extremely valuable learning because all my direct reports were significantly older. It was outside my technical expertise. And so I learned to really empower, similar, how do you manage, as you said, prima donnas, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's similar, you learn to empower, to listen, to ask questions, to understand their pain points, their challenges and then go work with my peers and my bosses to help eliminate barriers and really drive the mission of the organization. And it took a while because I knew I started with negative credibility, but in the end, I, I think all of them really enjoyed working for me and it was my first big management job that then ultimately allowed me to become CTO at Xerox.
And what was the most difficult management exper or leadership experience you've had along that Carrier journey? was the most difficult, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. So I was hired by the new CEO, John Ayers, brilliant guy. Um, and so we very much aligned with what needed to be done. Carrier, I call it my mini MBA because it was a sabbatical from Xerox, right? That was a year and a half I left Xerox. Carrier acquired one company each and every month, uh, whether it was a mom and pop distributor or a big new, uh, for example, air conditioning R&D facility in Latin America versus India or whatever. So we had all these different refrigerants and fans. And by then I knew learning the technology was not gonna be difficult, mm -hmm. right? So I, I studied all the thermodynamics and everything for a couple of weekends. And, and then of course, if you, lead a large technical organization, they love to teach you and they love showing their great work, right? So, uh, but the vision was we're gonna go to platform-based approach. We're gonna have one refrigerant, one whatever, uh, standardized fans, etc. And that was just very, very difficult and very hard, even with the strong support of the CEO. Because if in Europe they used one refrigerant, in, in the US another one, I wanted to move to, uh, an even more environmentally friendly refrigerant back, this was in the year 2001, so a long time ago, which we ultimately did with the support of the CEO, but it just was very hard because I didn't have the whole organization in the boat with me. Mm -hmm. so, and is that what, so you talked a little bit about leaving and going back to zero. Yes. I mean, was that a difficult decision to leave? Uh, no, it wasn't difficult. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, and, and in Xerox, I mean, it's really, I worked in total 25 years, and the last many, uh, when Ursula Burns was CEO for seven years, before that, Anne Mulkey was CEO, and even when I left Xerox to go to Carrier, the CEO personally called me and said, Sophie, uh, I hope you're not leaving because we're in a bad situation as a company. I am going to turn this company around, which she did, uh, and I, uh, uh, and we just said, if I ever, even before I left, that, I told her, if you ever need a new CTO, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> but I came back as a chief engineer and then CTO five years later, yeah. yeah. So as you say, one of your messages is about not burning bridges because yes. sometimes you want to come back or the CEO from Carrier going to another company and you joining their board, so. Or building... IBM to IBM, Xerox to Xerox, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. So IBM is obviously another storied company as is uh, Xerox. And so I'm just curious, when you got to IBM and IBM Research here in Cambridge, what was different about the cultures compared to Xerox, even though it's also full of brilliant people? Yeah, it's very, very much of the items or the culture was exactly the same, right? So my, my main office was actually in Yorktown Heights. Mm -hmm. I had another office here in Cambridge, so I took that Salah train down to New York very frequently. Uh, but many things were the same, like uh, really uh, driving for excellence, publishing at the best conferences, in the best papers, uh, focusing on intellectual property. IBM is totally amazing, uh, the, has been number one in the number of patents issued to the company each and every year. 12,000 patents or even more at the moment on a yearly basis. Um, it's, uh, so the scientific excellence and working with brilliant people really from all over the world, right? I mean, PhD scientists come to do their studies uh, in different places of the world and often stay there or uh, again at Xerox we had five labs, IBM at 21 different locations. Uh, so it was basically very similar from a scientific entrepreneurial culture uh, also lots of outside funding versus inside funding as uh, Xerox had, except on steroids, much bigger. Um, the, the other thing that in the culture that was similar was a very inclusive culture, and I explicitly looked for that, right? Both companies have women CEOs, uh, a track record of building a diverse environment, which is a ticket to the game to building an inclusive environment. So making sure the environment is very diverse and all these dimensions I mentioned before, and then really making sure it's inclusive, right? That the people, no matter who you are, that you're hurt, you're respected, you have power, uh, depending on where you are in the organization, et cetera, right? So these two things were very similar. Uh, where it was different, um, I think as IBM, again, had a much broader business, everything 
uh, the, the thinking, the really big thinking, the big dreams, like what is the next billion dollar business? So they, they, IBM really is very good at uh, big thinking and, and going in, um, for example, they, uh, the, the blockchain business was already established at least five or six years ago now, the quantum computing business established. So taking these really big bets mm -hmm. uh, based on excellent technologies is something that uh, I really admired at IBM and how they did it. So I'm curious, I mean, you've talked a couple of times already about diversity and obviously being female isn't what defines you as a leader, but it is obviously, you know, part of who you are. Um, to what extent did you feel as if you should or should not, or wanted to, or didn't want to make gender and diversity a particular issue of your leadership? Um, I mean, I'm a woman. I've always been delighted that I could help blaze a trail for women and minorities and immigrants after me. But I've been so lucky, especially at IBM and Xerox, that I did not need to blaze the original trail. Right? There have been many women, and Xerox has really committed for decades, it started in the 60s or in the 70s, um, of really making sure it's an inclusive organization. So I often tell uh, individuals when they're looking for their first job or, or when they're looking for a new job, go somewhere where you can see people who, uh, who look and feel like yourself, right? If you go for an interview as a women engineer and you have a day interview and the whole day you don't see any other women, or you're a foreigner uh, and you don't see any other foreigners. Uh, so just don't go there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, it, I've been always a champion to make sure to uh, create inclusive organizations, uh, to make sure my team was very diverse. And in the beginning, as I said, you need to prioritize. When my kids were little, uh, for a long time I was a single mom, but when my kids were little, I just didn't have time to be part of the uh, employee resource groups, like we had the, the Women Alliance and many other resource groups. But then once I became corporate officer and the kids were older, uh, I uh, became the champion first for black women at Xerox, where I really got to know uh, their pain points and how could I help them to build better careers at Xerox. And I had one sister growing up, but after having been part of the Black women in Xerox community. I had so many sisters uh, <laughs> after uh, having done that for three years. And then I became six years a champion at Xerox for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender uh, uh, community of employees. And again, I learned so much and we made so many changes. We put transgender insurance in place. Uh, we helped in New York State to um, uh, get equal marriage rights passed, etc. So I became a a big champion because it all comes down to people. How do you create an organization where you can create maverick teams that are gonna do something beyond what's normally possible and so people really need to bring their whole self to work. So I think that leads me into the thing I've been wanting to ask you for, you know, since we started this conversation, which is, as you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about innovation. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you'd be willing to talk to us a little bit about how you think about leading the innovation process. So with permission of my leadership center colleagues, I'm going to see whether we can just merge the leadership uh, questions and the innovation questions okay. and ask you to talk a little bit about that. Okay, cool. I want to make, uh, how much, more? we have to make sure to get That's questions. That's the last question also. that yes, I'm going okay, to, cool. so perfect, a, perfect. A, a warning to the audience, I'm yeah, going to open yeah. up so questions I think, after this. I think in addition to, um, of course, making sure whether you're a startup, I mean, the first couple of people you hire or that join your startup is extremely critical. They're going to set the culture for the rest of your journey. Uh, like I built new research labs, uh, the same in India, uh, when I built a new research lab there for Xerox, I was, super conscious of who are, both from a level of excellence, you need to hire the most best people or, or the best in their field that are admired and then attract other people. So people is number one. The number two is the customer. Truly, truly making sure you understand the pain points and the dreams of the users of your products or services or solutions that you are developing. Um, and so at Xerox and at IBM, we had ethnographic experts that would go in and understand the true pain points because what people say, and in fact, I have a, I have a, a little thing there. So often what people say and what they do is actually not totally aligned. So understanding the pain points and the dreams. And in fact, Xerox was not so good at that because in the 70s, we launched a color copier yes. in the 70s. 
there were no color originals. <laughs> so if you have the technology, you can truly be too early. I did not know uh, that. That's a really good yeah. story. That's no, going to appear in an MBA lecture <laughs> at any moment, I think. But anyway, yeah. color originals soon after that became uh, ubiquitous and people, but mm -hmm. of course then it was all printing and people didn't really copy anymore. But anyway, <laughs> so you can often have too many bells and whistles. Uh, mm -hmm. And so focusing on what's the minimum viable product, what's really the pain point is extremely important. Another key uh, leadership lesson is you might have whatever, thousands of people around the world, but there's so many other partners you can partner with, right? So go find them, partner with them, whether it's startups or companies, and we'll okay, at Xerox would say partner or parish, like really making sure that you bring the right people to help you launch uh, your products and services. And then number four, what's very important, uh, can anybody read this? Yes, what does it say? Crisis, Crisis huh? Good. You, can you read something else? <laughs> yes, exactly. So this is the word crisis, but if you cover the left stroke, uh -huh. the right stroke is opportunity. Oh, oh. That's yes, it's good, eh? That's very good. So I, I like got that. this proverb or whatever you want, this word uh, in grad school as a student. And so anytime I was in a difficult situation, whether somebody pub published a technical paper that I was also working on, I'm no longer the first, it's like, what's the opportunity? Or whether something really bad happens, I mean, somebody gets sick, or uh, that there is some a, a natural disaster, what is the opportunity? People can reach out and help each other. Often, um, I mean, it's so ingrained in my mind to have this opportunity mindset, mm -hmm. uh, that even if somebody kind of, you break up with your girlfriend, it's like, it's an opportunity to meet maybe another even better person, right? So. <laughs> Um, or your boyfriend. <laughs> anyway, so in the business too, you have to look up at the opportunities. And again, I said this was a really great culture thing too, right? If you don't take a risk, like invest heavily in the next great technology, if you just don't invest at all, it's a higher risk than, uh, anyway, you need to look at the opportunity. So not being afraid to look at the opportunity in everything you do. And then the last thing as a leadership, I always worked extremely hard to create a fun, I call it fun, but it's really an environment where people can be happy. And this, for example, was in Yorktown Heights, uh, uh, some of the women scientists I work with. But you have to create an environment where people can not only be happy at work, uh, but also at home. And so these are the six we were talking about earlier, right? So this is a, dec a decade ago, I remarried uh, and moved to Boston. My husband is professor here at MIT and our six kids, uh, five of them uh, in the science technology world. And then- You've the got one of them who's a, a banker, is that yeah, right? Yeah, finance. yeah, finance. He just graduated, the little guy on the left is now taller than his dad, but um, <laughs> he's looking for a job. So if any of you need somebody with an accounting finance business degree, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> Which has grown up surrounded by engineers. That's right, these are all engineers. <laughs> anyway, so cool, yeah, so these are really some of the lessons, and that's in addition to, of course, doing good business models, portfolio planning, having discipline, time to market processes. It's at this meta level, right? Focusing on, on people, customers, partners, not being afraid and, and having fun. Thank you. So with that in mind, don't be afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Villa, you've got your hand up first. Does he need a microphone? You need a microphone. I'm sure he because doesn't, they're taping, but I'm sure there is one. Yeah. Okay, cool. Aha. Yeah, at speed, there's a race. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Uh, Sinan Abushanab, I work here at Sloan. Thank you for a great talk. So, lessons learned, I wrote them down, and I'm going to kind of think a lot about those. Are there things that you have to kind of unlearn while you kind of were going on this journey and moving yeah, yeah, between yeah. these? That is a fantastic question. And it comes to uh, that it's all about people, the relationship. When you're hired, especially as a PhD scientist, it's all about creating an exceptional, correct solution that works, that has a quality, the cost, the delivery. So it was all the first many years, I gained credibility by filing IP papers. It was all about the science and the data. And then when you grow up in the organization, it's much, it's of course important, but it's much more about 
the relationships, the peers, understanding fears, understanding priorities, being much more empathetic. So, I mean, so you, I had to, and I still struggle with it because I get so passionate about the science and the data. So I, I might lean in with the data. Hey, you know, we have this really great technology. No, you have to kind of, the passion has to always be there, I think. But you have, because that's also what researchers like and what the scientific community likes. But then you, I had to really learn to lead with the business value. You talked about hiring smart people, hiring the top talent. So as you think about your leadership journey and you'd hired uh, top talent, did you use your personal brand to, to attract the right people? Was it your firm's brand? How did you think about and go about hiring and attracting top talent? Okay, yeah, so that has also changed over time, right? So 20, 30 years ago, there was very little personal brand as people can build it now. Like I hope all of you have LinkedIn profiles and, uh, and keep those up to date, etc. The way we hire talent, it also depends on which organization you manage. I always mostly manage very uh, scientific organization, research labs. Uh, there we uh, mostly directly worked with universities, right? So we would reach out to both the students groups on campus or all over the world, we would link to the university, we would make sure uh, the, the lab that we were creating or that existed had a good brand of doing uh, extraordinary work. But most of the scientists that we hired with advanced degrees would know about us through the conferences they went to, for example. That's how I knew about both Xerox and IBM when I joined originally. Uh, so it really depends who, who you're hiring for and what you're hiring for. So all the way on the other hand is I am a public company director and there the other directors are often hired, you can say, on, to the board because of relationships, because of people they have worked with, uh, because of somebody says, oh, I was on this other board with this person or I worked with this person and, and she or he is really very good and would be a great addition. So it's a combination of both, and it really depends for what and who you're trying to hire. Yep. But the references are often, especially at the more junior level, most important. And as a manager, I would always talk to the references that they would give and always say, give me their, uh, their challenges, right? What are one or two things that, uh, that are not good about this person or that are challenges? All of us are flaws. And it's so hard to get to know those before you hire. And so knowing that has been extremely valuable to me because even if somebody has a flaw, then you can think of how do I mitigate that even before they make similar mistakes as they could have made before. You learn from them, right? Okay? Thank you for, yeah, thank you. Um, I, my first job was at IBM Research Labs in Yorktown Heights. Great, great place. And uh, it was a great place. You know, a tremendous amount of innovation, great people, great culture. Uh, but my question is, where did, where did uh, these labs go wrong in terms of innovation? Because as much as there was innovation and sort of new ideas, but just never, uh, you know, it wasn't able to monetize a lot of the, lot of the research work that was done there. Uh, how would you do it differently? So, uh, never is the wrong word. Uh, Xerox Park was instrumental at helping to invent a connected laser printer, for example, which created a $100 billion industry, in which Xerox was a leader for many years. So, some of these labs, uh, clearly have paid over and over for themselves, the investments the companies make. Uh, what happens, and you, and you see that at MIT all the time, if you hire brilliant people with many ideas, you're gonna come up with many more ideas and investment opportunities than money available to commercialize all of them. So what, what you have to do is, of course, you have to prioritize. You're gonna place our bets on these items, and, and yes, these are all fantastic ideas, but it just doesn't fit at the moment. Um, and so what, what we did different at both IBM 
and at Xerox, IBMers, of course, before I joined, uh, is to allow these researchers, as I said before, to also go find funding in other areas. So as soon as we incorporated Park as a business, uh, what became Park Inc., the Park patents are separate than the Xerox patents, if you look them up. So it's a separate entity, and they could start leveraging and do research for other corporations. So some of the ideas that just didn't fit at that time uh, in Xerox's strategy, for example, uh, they could then still find and make an impact to the world through other uh, paths to uh, end users. Of course, in hindsight, it's always easy to say, oh, we should have invested in, in A, B, or C, because look, this is now this big business, and, and this other business is now worth much less. And so, but at the moment itself, uh, figuring out other ways, this is what I worked very hard on at Xerox, and I think, um, in, in a good way, considering the business uh, constraints of the companies, how else can we fund this uh, research and keep good competencies growing and in place so that at the right time, Xerox can benefit from it. Thank you. Yep, there's a question back there. I actually work at IDEX as well. But, oh, you do, um, congratulations. Do. Yeah, thank you for yeah. your leadership at the company. Um, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about contrasting leadership um, between the companies that you work for and sitting on a board of directors. Con uh, contrasting how you lead? If there are just different nuances between those experiences. Yes, of course. There is a, uh, if I understand your question directly, right? An operational role, I've had always operational roles on this journey is very different than being a director on a board. And again, IDEX is a totally amazing company with a, with a really, really great leadership team. But as a director, uh, there is this, uh, this uh, quote, I don't quite like it, but it is uh, nose in and hands out. <laughs> so you need to know what's going on, you need to be aware of it but you're not gonna fix it, right? You, you can't become operational and say, hey, you should invest more here, or you should really replace that person, or whatever. Uh, so, as a director, you're there to ask the right questions, really probe, give advice, support the CEO and his team, help set a strategic plan, make sure that's very robust, and then making sure that the right leadership team, starting with the CEO, uh, is in place to continue to uh, make sure the company continues to be successful for many years to go. And again, that's something I had to unlearn. When I first joined the board, uh, I think it was a board here in Peabody, I, I was so used to be operational that when uh, I was also uh, first on the technology committee and then chairing the technology committee, but I would almost do a business review, right? I mean, show me your portfolio, what are you investing in, and going way too much into details that as a director you really shouldn't be doing. So I think in the interest, oh, there's one more question. Why don't we have a last question? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know more about um, diversity of speciality. Of what specialty? How do, yeah, how do you feel about diversity of speciality? I mean, I'd like to increase diversity of my team. However, one of the typical challenge from others, you know, full labs, uh, for that similarity is that, you know, if we increase diversity, the quality of product or the speciality of the team can be decreasing. But maybe you don't think so. So it, it, please, the, please let me know. No, it depends which team you're leading, right? So if you are creating a product, any product, you need multiple specialties, right? So you need people that might be extremely strong in software, and even within software there are multiple specialties. You need people, for example, uh, I mean, you can give any example, building a quantum computer, which is what IBM has just done, or uh, you need everybody for people who truly understand materials, to people who truly understand the systems, the cloud, writing a whole new language to program this computer to electronics. So, so you need a multidisciplinary team of people to pull off such a complex 
system, but even at the low end, when we were making uh, thermal ink jet printers, we needed people that are mechanical, electrical, software. I mean, you need to uh, have these multidisciplinary teams to really bring anything to the market. Many organizations, at least in the past, we would organize by competency, right? That the area manager, the first line manager, to really focus on building extremely deep technical competencies in certain areas. And then these people are put on loan under a project manager to deliver these more complex projects. That that's the, gives the benefit that people can mentor each other, that new hires like to work in an organization where they can be part of an exceptional team that they can learn from. Um, and so companies go back and forth between pulling people in one organization to deliver something that is really multi uh, dimensional multi-skill versus having people remain in their deep skill level. It depends exactly on what you're trying to do in your group. Thank you. Well, I think in the interest of time, knowing that our students Excellent. have to get to class by one, um, I want to say thank you for being here with us. My and I pleasure. hope that your continued time at MIT continues to be fun yes. and that you will help us continue to build bridges across campus because we know that's important. Sophie, thank you. It's my pleasure. Excellent. Thank you. I shouldn't be clapping. I clap for you. <laughs> we'll clap for each other. And if any of you have a business or want to talk on any of these topics, I will do some more uh, office hours and they can sign up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.